And I'd like us to kind of reflect on some of what we just heard, but also offer new perspectives. And Monica, I want to start with you. And cities are really a nexus, and we can learn a lot from our history. So what can we learn about the past in order to have this sustainable urbanization? So we think of ourselves as being bad modern people who generate lots of trash and throw it away. But as an archaeologist, I can assure you that every ancient city is also full of trash. So the propensity to acquire, consume, and discard is not a modern problem. It's an urban condition. So given that people like to have new things in cities, perhaps one thing that we could do is encourage experiences and the consumption of new experiences, which do not take up a lot of space. Um, think, for example, about how popular marathons are. Marathons make use of the space that's already there, but it provides many people with an opportunity to celebrate together, and then it also gives the whole city pride, even for people who are not actually running. So the idea of consumption of experiences. Exactly, as a sustainable concept. Uh, so the creation of cultural institutions is not just as a matter of culture, but also as a matter of sustainability. All right, that's an excellent idea. Karen, welcome back. And in early, early sessions today, you talked about, I think by 2050, you know, we don't even have all the cities on our landscape today. And so if we're looking forward a little bit, um, you know, can we learn from the past and build that already into the future as we're developing new cities going forward? Will that help us with sustainability as we urbanize more? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We must learn from the past, right? Uh, I mean, I think that there are very different opportunities going forward. And I, that was what I was suggesting earlier today is that the strategies that we deploy for existing cities will be very different from the cities of tomorrow that haven't been built. And the opportunities will be very, very different, right? The ones, and we heard that earlier today from Gautam and others that the cities that have already been built, we're, we need to think about retrofitting. We need to think about different types of interventions at multiple scales. Whereas places that haven't been built, those have different challenges, many of them around governance, around finance, um, and, and, and yet there are huge opportunities for these places that haven't been built. I think one of the, the challenges though is that so much of thinking about cities and, and um, like for example, with climate change has historically focused on single sector efficiencies. So we focus on buildings becoming more efficient or cars or mobility, but the, that doesn't really take advantage of what cities have to offer, which is this integrated way of thinking about efficiencies and lifestyle change. Well, Nicholas, I'm going to jump to you because earlier you talked about this fragmented um, system that we're in. And I think that kind of dovetails onto what Karen was just saying. You know, we've dealt with things in small fragments, but how do we actually lace that together for more comprehensive solutions? Yes, uh, I would say maybe here that it's not possible to... Uh, collect all those fragments and uh, create a jar, as we would do in archaeology, out of them. Uh, therefore, what we are trying to do with this intersecting approach, uh, it's an overall umbrella approach um, that we have developed with over 30 universities, think tanks, etc., and others, is we delineate, we put some, 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 some items and delineate spheres of action and research. We try to reduce uh, the, uh, the scale of uncertainty and complexity. And we are aware that we have only limited abilities. So let me just take very, very briefly uh, three concrete examples, right? So the first, the first approach was to think about not just cities, but also infrastructure, so the way they are connected, right? Uh, the second approach that we are currently developing and trying to go deeper is addressing the economy, right? Something in the economy produces too much waste, to consume too much resources is not right. Um, so what about circular economy and how far we can go? Maybe this will be a dead end, maybe not, right? Circular economy and resources. The other, the other way around, and this connects very much with what uh, Karen was mentioning, is creative economy, and what, what you were mentioning too. And creative economy uh, uh, is, is also a very good way forward, creative economy and the future of work. So this will be the next. And then afterwards, we'll try to address how institutionally the multilateral system can also encompass such results. So this is a step by step, but we are trying modestly, step collectively, to reduce 
the, the, the size of uncertainties to, to manage sizable issues. And one underlying factor, it was mentioned also previously by several speakers, is trust. Because if you don't create trust with so many different peoples across the globe, across regions, and we cannot meet very easily because of the COVID, it's without trust, you go nowhere. So how doing that also contributes to create trust and reinforce that is also it's a kind of a, a, a ligne rouge background of the whole processes. Serge, welcome. It's your first time on the stage here. Yes. This, and I know you think a lot about disparity of situations between smaller towns yes. and the metropolis. So yeah. maybe you have some views about that and how we can harmonize. Yeah. First, I would like, like to start by saying that I'm not an urbanist, and so my view is quite general. I, as a scientist, as a physicist, I know what are the problems and what has to be solved. And I understand also that it's a very the problems are very complex. You cannot solve each issue one by one. You have to integrate everything, as you said. And the best way to do that, I think, is to start at a rather small scale. So my feeling is that uh, small size or medium-sized cities are in a better position to implement these things. First of all, because the mayors and city councils of, in, in these cities are in general less under pressure of a very fast political change which occurs at the government level, at the uh, big government level. So they have more time to implement solutions which in any way would take time to give results, to yield results. So my feeling is that uh, the small cities would behave like kind of show case for, uh, to prepare the thing for larger cities uh, to implement these solutions. We know exactly what has to be done. As uh, you have to get more efficient uh, uh, buildings, which which uh, don't waste energy. You have to have transportation, which don't re relies on fossil fuels. You have to uh, improve uh, the way agriculture is being uh, performed, even in cities. You have to grow. Uh, maybe you have to grow plants or to grow vegetables in buildings, as was shown on the on the picture, which was on your screen. All this. I think will be achieved easily in small-scale places. I am much less optimistic about the situation of big megapolis around the world because of the reason I already said, and also because very often these cities are in uh, underdeveloped countries with less economical resources and with huge challenges. Uh, the migration of population, which already occurs without the climate change, will increase the pressure in the future on these cities and uh, it is really a challenge. And if you add to that that some of these cities are uh, threatened by the rise of the ocean level, which, uh, appears, which appears to be a big problem due to climate change, then uh, the solution, solutions will have to be implemented, which uh, are very difficult to find. I, I think it's very difficult to predict the future, and, and the pictures that we saw of these buildings with plants and so on reminds me of similar pictures, similar postcards, which were issued at the beginning of last century about the city of the future, which was in 19, what was predicted for the 1950s or the year 2000. And if you look at these postcards, it's, it is not at all what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, that topic, City of the Future, you covered a little bit in both Monica and um, Nicholas. You're both nodding, and I, I can see Karen also moving your head. So any reactions to the ideas about where to start? You know, you were talking about... Well, go ahead, Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to touch on what Serge just said about these smaller cities. And, you know, even though you're not an urbanist, Serge, I, you've hit it completely on the spot. I, I mean, this is where I think a lot of the big opportunities are are these small and medium-sized towns. And I think one of the big opportunities is because that their infrastructure is not locked in, their behaviors are not locked in in the same way as these very large cities. I also want to just very quickly touch on something that Monica said about um, you know, these shared experiences. And, and, and it seems like there, I, I want to again focus on opportunity that cities offer this opportunity for shared economy. And I think we've only just begun to tap into the, the, the opportunities there um, uh, with, with the shared economy. Monica, you want to react to that? Yes, the idea of being able to compete with your friends about who has had the coolest experience, who went to the best concert, who went to the best fair, who had the best picnic, 
These are things that don't bring back any physical objects necessarily, but that bring back a sense of memory. And you know, memory is a very efficient mechanism of change. Is that going to be a big part of the fabric of the future city? Yes, yes. I was just thinking that uh, just pre-pandemic, it was all about global cities still. And now the pandemic has gone, and it's all about small and medium-sized cities. So we need to take care also of, the, uh, of, the, of our own mood and, and what is fashionable. Um, because if, if you trace back, for example, a global crisis uh, in 2000, a global financial crisis was largely an issue of real estate that was built like with, with, with no rational, and this created the subprime crisis, and it became a global, a global crisis. This has very little to do with how well a local government can be managed. So those, those systems, which are completely unregulated, and we know see the same thing happening, but in China, right, uh, at even a larger scale uh, than back in 2008 in the US. Uh, those urban factors, and how they are part of fragile, uh, global systems must not be must not be underestimated. Otherwise, uh, we will repeat in a different way somewhat the same mistakes that were made. And we need this is if you allow me just on, on two, ten seconds. We need also to figure out how the different bits and pieces of our own discussion and conversation here, as in so many, can also be reflected in agendas. Going back to to politics or to policies, right, in global agendas or in regional agendas, because we need, we need to frame this into politics in a different way, right? This was, this, hence this idea of, uh, you know. You, know, you were talking before, Serge, um, one wants to convey a message of, you know, real positivity around this idea as well. I mean, you know, we're thinking about 50 years, we want to really move forward. Thoughts about that? Moving forward in a real positive way, we yeah. can we can make an yeah. impact. Yeah, I think a very important word which was uh, uh, put forward before is the word of trust. It's important. You cannot build anything if there is no trust between the citizen and uh, the policymakers. And again, this brings me back to small or medium-sized cities. In France, it's quite clear that the only politicians which still have the trust of population as the mayors or city councillors of small or medium-sized places. Because here you can have, uh, the citizen can discuss and you can build up uh, solutions and hopefully this solution will, will spread at a larger scale later on. But uh, as was said before, the politi uh, polit politi makers at the national scale make promises and the mayors in small city act and, and do things. And, I think it's a big difference. You know, and that touches on something we heard earlier about really getting to understand the people around you and what their role is in society. We heard the discussion around, you know, sitting with the police officers or the police officers going into the communities. It's all about really having sort of a shared consciousness and kind of a unified goal moving forward. All right, folks, I think we're at the uh, end of our time here. Too short, but an important topic. <laughs>